Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. The uh, wonder of having Jonathan Gruden give us a keynote talk this morning. Um, I was very happy when Jonathan accepted the keynote today. Jonathan has been in this field for plenty of years, indeed more than I've been alive. Um, um, and is a very prestigious member of this community. Um, I believe from 1997 to 2003 was the editor-in-chief of the ACM SIGCHI um, uh, Human Computer Interaction uh, magazine or publication, and then 2004 was inducted into the SIGCHI Chi Academy. So truly an honor to have Jonathan here. And let's welcome him and let him give his talk. Well, it's uh, it's uh, it's good to be here. Um, see some familiar faces and some some new faces here. I hope to have a chance to talk with some of you because because the conference is uh, let me turn this on because the conference is in town. Of course, I have trouble attending the whole thing. I have a an intern whose uh, final week is this week who's giving her final talk this afternoon, so I'll be in and out. And she, in fact, is working on um, on uh, a project related to what I'll be talking about, although I, uh, it's not quite far enough along for me to talk about that her particular work. So I'll be talking about um, knowledge management broadly defined and how uh, and, and, and give some suggestions or, or um, speculations here about how emerging technologies I think are going to have a big impact in this uh, area, familiar to, to many of us. Um, if there's one thing that digital technology seems like it should be able to help us with, it's, it's accessing information, uh, project-related information, or information in organizations that's, that's uh, over time. That, I mean, the, you, you want to get access to this information. It's been represented in digital format. Uh, the, of course, the digital information persists, and so it's there. Um, and yet, it's been very difficult to to do this effectively. So over my career, which is, uh, I don't know if it's quite as long, I don't know if it really began before the, uh, Patrick was, was born, but uh, over the years I've off and on been involved in about a half a dozen different projects focused on facilitating access to uh, enterprise knowledge. And the, and we sort of slowly made progress on the, on the technical aspects, but in the end all of them failed, or none of them have really worked out the way that they were, that, that we expected. The, the notion that, 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 that there's, there are documents around the, the organization that would be of, of use, um, there are people who have knowledge that would be of use, and that there should be a way to very easily reach out and, and find those, um, has just turned out to be more difficult than anticipated. And so over those half a dozen or so experiences, uh, we've uh, come to some conclusions about what are some of, what are some of the problems in doing this okay well one is that it's just difficult to actually find the documents um, typically people are asked to add some sort of metadata some sort of description to the document that will facilitate retrieval and that's an effort and people just often don't do it now there are cases where the, the value is, is so great that people will do it i mean libraries will go out and and uh, we've got different classification systems there. In some instances, people will make the effort or, or people will be hired to add the metadata. But on the whole, um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an effort. And people also disagree on labels. So if you come up with some sort of a, a, uh, a set of, of tags or, or labels, uh, keywords, then um, Getting people to actually use it is a problem, and even if they do use it, when people go to retrieve the information, they, if they're not familiar with it, they'll come up with different labels. So there have been studies that have really shown that people have very different terminology for the same simple concepts. Uh, then the next problem is that even if people do find a document uh, in a repository, it's difficult to assess 
the document. Why is it there? I mean, is this document put there because it's the final version? Is it is it a version that was in progress? Is one you know is, is, is section three complete and out there for comment, and the other section still being worked on? So you look at the document, and it, it can be very difficult to uh, to to find the context for that document. Typically, when documents have been put out, um, there has been an explanation that's gone out to some people, uh, often in an email distribution list, um, but that email distribution list isn't associated with the document. You don't have access to that information. You may not be able to, to find it even if you do have the email. And so you basically don't have the context for these objects um, in many cases. And as a result, when we've sort of looked at how people do uh, try to find knowledge. They'll make some effort when when they have these systems around. They'll make some effort to use the system, and then finally, after five or ten minutes, they'll get on the phone to call somebody who might know somebody who might be able to help them. Uh, now, in order to um, uh, so I, I want to make the thesis. This is actually changing very. That this there's a potential for this to change very dramatically in the next several years, and I want to step back and and and. Uh, and so I look at the last, um, at, at some of the things we've seen over the last 10 years, uh, efforts that, that are related to this, to this general, um, general problem. One was that in the 1990s, we had this interest in virtual worlds. There was a lot of 2D, 2.5D, 3D virtual world activity. Um, the pioneers sort of went out there. The focus of a lot of this work was on, on dealing with the perceptual issues of operating in these 3D worlds, uh, the cog uh, cognitive uh, aspects of, of navigating in them and finding information in them, and just whether or not they were useful. So here's an example of a sort of entertainment-oriented uh, world of this sort. And there were efforts to apply this to corporate, to enterprise knowledge management. So here's a a description of Boeing World that uh, I got from Steve, Pol from my colleague Steve Poltrock, who's arrived in the back here. Um, so this is very much this is a, a very serious effort that they put up, again with this with this notion that you could represent information there and navigate around and find it. But it didn't actually work out that way. What you found in these virtual worlds was typically that people would go into them and there wasn't very much they could do. So they could chat a little bit. Um, in addition, around the same time that all this was, was very actively happening in the mid-1990s, a web came along and sort of distracted a lot of people and attention turned elsewhere. You didn't really see much contribution to enterprise knowledge management from these early efforts at uh, establishing digital environments. There were some places where, it, it, where of course, uh, those technologies were used, so in, in collaborative simulations and multiplayer online games, but in general for a lot of enterprise activities, they weren't integrated in, that you couldn't access documents, you couldn't very easily um, deal with a lot of other digital information in your environment, and so they weren't, uh, they weren't used. But, I, but today I think we're actually we sort of past the pioneering stage of, of um, of mapping out these online environments. There's just a huge amount of activity now that's going on online, social activity. It's not in 2.5 or 3D virtual worlds necessarily, but there's a lot of activity out there. And people are actually taking, going beyond uh, the, 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 the pioneering phase to actually making these online environments inhabitable. And so some of the aspects that have changed are instead of this focus on cognition and strictly um, performance, uh, there's more of a focus on emotion and engagement in these in these online um, spaces, both the individual and the social spaces. There's a lot more focus on on the design. The design capabilities, of course, are much greater now. And some of the areas, some of the the technologies that are uh, relevant here are digital photos, which have just really exploded online. Um, and then t the phenomena of tagging. Uh, web blogs, and of course search technologies that, that is an extremely active area of online um, research and, and development as well. And I, and, and I think another change that's coming along that's going to change the, the picture within organizations soon is that a lot of these emerging technologies, instant messaging and, and SMS have been around, now we've got tagging, web blogs, a lot of them have really been picked up by the younger generation. Uh, 
And in, in using them, in, it, was, it was a um, surprise to me a couple years ago to go to a, a, a talk in which some ethnographers described the study of university students and, and made a very convincing case that for them, instant messaging in this country and text messaging elsewhere had replaced email or the phone as their dominant, as their primary, overall as their primary mode for communication. This is, represents a real radical change from, from my generation. And as the, the students are using these technologies, often not for, for, uh, for strictly work purposes, um, but they're developing a lot of behaviors around them. Multitasking that we read about, multimedia authoring skills, te, uh, the ability to search and filter and browse information very rapidly. And they will be bringing these skills into the enterprises, just as an earlier generation brought in text editing, word processing, and email, and finding ways to apply them. And I think there are some very strong parallels uh, between this, this sort of generational change. I think this is arguably the first significant genera generational change uh, in technology use in about 20 years. And I'll just use the case of instant messaging to illustrate um, the, the, the sort of parallels uh, between, in this case, how email was perceived and used in 1985 and how instant messaging is in many places perceived, in, in many enterprises perceived and used uh, now. So, I mean, it's, for those of us familiar with email, even if we went through that period in 85, it's, it's easy to forget about the fact that email clients weren't interoperable uh, back then. That your email access was largely limited to your buddies back then because there was no directory for looking up people's email addresses. People had very obscure uh, 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 email addresses, so you had to know them in order to 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 uh, connect to them. Email was storage was so expensive back then that you couldn't people couldn't really save um, their their they couldn't archive their email. I remember the first person who argued that you should keep all of your email, Tom Landauer, and, the, and that was in the late 80s. And it just seemed like this radical uh, and very sort of uh, profligate kind of notion that, that you would devote that much storage space to, to email. And as partly as a result of that, it was a real the informal option. It's very interesting to hear kids talk about why they adopted IM, and they say, well, it's informal, unlike email, which is very formal. For, for us, of course, email back then was the informal option over formal memos. And you st still see a lot of organizational distrust. You know, IM is just something that students do to waste time, which was exactly what was said when I first went into a high-tech company uh, in, or not first, but when I went into one in, in 1983, you know, and I said, we should be using email, and it was, that's something students use to, to waste time, learn to write formal memos, and send it up the, the hierarchy. Um, so you see that, 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 that uh, a lot of parallels there. And I think today, of course, it's changed across the board in the case of, of email, and the same changes are happening in instant messaging um, quite rapidly. In fact, you know, there's a lot of pressure to, to allow people to archive IM and, uh, or even necessity for archiving it, and that has an effect on how informal people will be in the medium. And it's, it's undoubtedly going to become mission critical the way uh, email did. There's one other slide to, to illustrate this, this issue of, of generational change. What does, does anybody, can anybody guess what they're, what they're looking at there? What this is a, this is an actual advertisement. Uh, um, so it looks like a, looks like a sort of a cell phone type handset. Uh, but if you look, look, it's uh, what it actually is, it's a, it's an input device for a PC, for a Windows 98, et cetera, PC for somebody who is more comfortable entering text with this than with a QWERTY keyboard. Um, <laughs> there are people in that category now. Okay, so now I want to talk about how um, some of the other emerging technologies are going to address these challenges in knowledge management in organizations. So the first one, the fact that digital documents are difficult to find. It's hard to get people to agree to add metadata to their, to their objects and the disagreement over labels. And I think a, um, tagging is a very interesting phenomenon that, uh, that, um, that I want to explore a little bit here. 
in this context. How many people here have actually put, this is, a, this is one tagging site, Flickr, it's a photo site. How many people here have put photos up on Flickr? Is there anyone? Has anyone, how many people here have, have visited Flickr? Okay, so that's, so that's about half. Well, I'm going to go through and, uh, and describe it. Flickr, so it, Flickr is a, it's a hosted site for um, digital photographs, so you can actually put your own digital photographs out there on the site um, uh, without any charge. And one point about this technology, it's, it's, it's very lightweight, it's very easy to do this. Of course, it's very immediately uh, visible to others. Um, but the, another, uh, another uh, point to make here is that there's an actual individual benefit to this technology as there uh, are to others, which is that individuals will get personal benefit from putting their, their information out there. Um, and along with that, there's then the social benefit of having it available, potentially available to other people. So what is the individual benefit for hosting your photos out on Flickr, for putting all your personal photos out there? The individual benefit is that you can access them from anywhere. So you can, if you want to send, rather than having to package up a set of photos and send them to a relative, uh, family photos, you can just package them up, put them out there on the site, and your and the and, and family can access them directly. Or you can access them. You're visiting somewhere. You can get access to all of your photos, and you can put some very specific tag on it. You can put labels on it to make them easy to to find. So I could like put a label on Jonathan Gruden's. 2005 summer vacation, and I'll be the only person that's likely to type that in as a search term and, and, and find them. So, so you can sort of restrict access if you want, but I could also put uh, other tags on, such as England. And so this, I, I downloaded these, these uh, screenshots uh, in, I think it was in May. So these were, so I, I just typed in England as a search term, and there are 28,215 photos uh, of England on Flickr, and so there's the first set of them. Now I want to uh, point out uh, some of the features here. So first of all, what are tags? Well, tags are just keywords, and it just says there you can give your photos a tag, which is like a keyword. Uh, you can assign as many tags as you like to a photo. Okay, so that's England 28,000, as I mentioned. Now they have some other uh, features here that are um, of interest. One is they'll give you what are related tags. So in the case of England, not surprisingly, the most related are London, uh, UK, and church. And you can go into London, and uh, here's a picture of the London tags, uh, or the London photos. Now, actually, 70,260 photos on Flickr were at this time uh, tagged London. Now, a couple point, and then you see related tags here, England, Thames, UK. Now, a couple points here related to this to the, the keyword problem. One is people use different terms, but because it's, this is very visible, it's very easy to see the related terms, you can immediately see what are other terms that people are using. So, so in the case, you've got England and UK. And there's also Great Britain, um, uh, 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 United Kingdom. There are a whole range of terms that you could use for, for, for your photos. And if it matters to you, you can actually go in and very quickly see what terms are other people using. So there are 20,000 people that said England. There were uh, maybe about 1,000 who actually said, wrote out United Kingdom, a few thousand who said UK, um, others that said Great Britain. So you can go in and you can make a decision on what term or terms you want to use based on what other people are doing. So you can very easily check your terminology against uh, that of, of other users of the system. Okay, another interesting point here is that because there are 70,000 London photos and only 20,000 England photos, so this isn't hierarchical. You know, you, would, you might expect logically that there would be more in England uh, than there are in London because probably there are not that many pictures of Jack London or London, Ontario on there. On the other hand, the system can't automatically impose a hierarchy because there are going to be some pictures of Jack London that would not belong under England. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of a... Of a, of a of an issue to keep in mind there. Okay, now there's, in addition to the very highly related terms, there are also some less related terms. In the case of London here, you've got Big Ben Tube Underground, another set of uh, two synonymous entries, and so on. Bridge, um, Sign, 
And if you go, and then there's, here's Big Ben, there are 552 photos of Big Ben. Then you've got sign, you go to sign, these are clearly not going to all be photos of women. There are uh, 21,000 photos that are just labeled signs. So these are just pictures that people have taken, typically mostly of signs, and they just thought they were interesting for some reason or another, and so they put them out there on the web, on, the, on, the web, on Flickr. So there's a kind of a playful aspect to it as well. In fact, here's one called a tag called letter, and these are just mostly pictures of letters that people just thought were interesting and, and put out there. So there's, a, there's, a, there's sort of a huge, um, I believe there are now about 50 million, I haven't checked in the last few days, but there are about 50 million photos out there and very rapidly rising. There were 17 million when I checked in, in May. So this is something that took off this year and it's going very quickly. And there are almost no topics um, plausible topics that you can type in and, and not find photos of. So I, a co-sponsor of this conference, uh, Argon, I type that in, you can find photos of Argon. You see up at the top there are a couple uh, sorry, map photos. Now you could probably go and get this photo from the Argon website. Um, you probably couldn't get this photo described that's of the of the, of the, uh, the entrance with the, with the with the gate hours, but you might be able to find that information also on the, the official site. But here's one that you probably wouldn't find on the, on, the, uh, on, on the forum site. This is labeled, Watch Geese on Duty Outside the Entrance to the Physics Lab. Um, so, there's, uh, so there's just a, a, a um, this is just to illustrate the sort of diversity of photos that you get and the uh, ability to find information um, on this, uh, using this, this resource. And again, just another point here, down on the right you see a list of all the tags that have been associated with this particular photo. So there's this very quick visibility to kind of see what are the tags that are being used, what are the quantity, what's the quantity out there, what are people doing, what are the links that is there. Up in the top it, it gives you the photo stream for Dr. Engineer 001, that's the, the alias chosen by the person who took this particular photo, you can then go and see other photos that that person left. And it says this photo also belongs to a set called Argonne, Argonne National Laboratory. So again, you can go and uh, examine that particular set of photos taken by that individual. Okay, here's another, another example of tag. Uh, the Delicious site. How many people here have visited Delicious? Um, okay, so it's, I think it's the same, roughly the same hands as, as, as visited Flickr. So this is a site that's essentially a, um, it's a site of uh, URLs where people can put out URLs that, they, that are of interest to them and or the, 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 that link to uh, articles or pages that are of interest to them and share them with other people. So again, this has a personal feedback, a personal uh, uh, reward for doing it, which is that you can, um, you can save your own favorites or bookmarks out there on this publicly hosted site. So you don't have the problem of going to a different machine and not being able to access your own favorite URLs or visiting somebody and not being able to access them. You put them out there, you, know, you can put them out there and say this is you know, Matya's URLs, uh, not too many people are going to go and look for them there. But she can find all of her own URLs there. She may not have any interest in sharing them with, with anyone else, making them available to anyone else. Um, but if she does, then she can again put on a tag or a number of tags for that particular link that will enable other people to find it who are interested in those topics. On the right for the delicious site here is a set of the most active tags at the, current, at the, at the point in time when I downloaded this. The description of Delicious, it says it's a social bookmarks manager. It allows you to easily add web pages you like to your personal collection of links, to categorize those sites with keywords, and to share your collection not only among your own browsers and machines, but also with others. So that sort of captures uh, the, the, both the individual productivity benefits that will give people an incentive to use it, plus the social um, benefits that can be uh, added along with it. So some of the other features there is the most active 
set of tags there that can sort of give you an idea of what people are interested in and what tags they're using. So what tags you might want to use if the site of interest to you uh, has anything in common with the, with, the, with the keywords that are out there. There's also what you see um, in the sort of the center of the, of the page are the recent posts. So it's simply scrolling up recent posts. And then not too visible there, I've circled the, there are these, um, after each of the, the posts there, in, there's a sort of a pink highlighted uh, area that's actually highlighted on the site, which says that one circle there says, um, the, to, it's, the link is the Tofu Hut to music by Gerg, uh, by Gerg, the, the person who, who posted that, and 32 other people. So that's telling you how many other people have um, identified the Tofu Hut, in this case, as an interesting site. And so again, you get this, you get this sort of collaborative filtering. So here's a site on, on uh, another one with 111 people, Cook's Thesaurus, 147 other people put in links, you know, 899 to IE 6.0 quirks mode, and so forth. Um, if you haven't looked at it, uh, uh, I would recommend looking at it. There actually are, is a lot of interesting information sort of uh, that, that's floating through there. So here I've gone to, just to show that there's more than sort of music um, out there, there's a, one of the tags is business. So you can go to the business site. Again, you've got related tags to give you um, ideas of other, other places to visit. There's the, an RSS feed is available for Delicious. I'll say a little bit more about RSS, but that essentially is an automatically generated sort of metadata for the site that would allow you to actually um, subscribe to Delicious and get, be, be posted. If, if you wanted to get uh, sent your email postings that were, say, sent to business or sent to, to one of the other, with one of the other tags, you could have those automatically sent to you at your machine so you wouldn't have to go out periodically and look at it. So, again, it can be very lightweight to, 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 to interact with. Um, you know, this, this particular one I downloaded when I was just downloading this as an example, there was this essay called Hiring is Obsolete. That actually is a quite an interesting essay, so that would be one that you could go out and find. Uh, quite a lot of phenomena, particularly in the emerging um, technologies area, that you will pick up if you go and look at a site such as this. Okay, so, in, um, so I want to sort of wrap up on tagging here and move on on to some of the other issues, but one question that arises here is how far can you go with this kind of bottom-up approach? So the, the issue here is that instead of having a top-down ontology, you know, a, a carefully worked out framework for organizing information, this is very bottom-up. People are just generating it uh, in a sort of very uh, democratic maybe, but a very disorganized, initially disorganized fashion, and then there's some organization that emerges from it. How far can you go with just this bottom-up uh, approach. At what point will there be a need to, to sort of build in either tools that enable some kind of a uh, reflective top-down organization of the information to take place? Will there be some sort of a middle ground where the two merge? How will, the, how will this kind of a, a technology be useful within enterprises? Um, that's not very clear. You know, one question that, that when I first was thinking about it, you know, it was not so bad when there were 70,000 in May, when there were 70,000 uh, photos of London. Maybe I'd be willing to go through all 70,000, but today, you know, a few months have gone by, there are now over 200,000 photos of London. And, and so, is that going to make it sort of not so useful uh, to wade through? Well, interestingly, um, the people at Flickr, uh, which was, I guess, acquired by Yahoo, the people at Yahoo, I've been thinking about this too, and so here's an here are a couple examples of technologies that they've taken to allow maybe more bottom-up, um, but a higher level of organization. So they've got this concept of clusters. So you can, when you go to the London site now, you've got London clusters as one of your choices, and if you click on London clusters, uh, this is what you'll see. So what they've done is you cluster is one for people who put on tags London, uh, England, UK, Big Ben. So, so there you've got uh, our, our sort of required and then those others. Um, next one is Thames Bridge River, you know, Tube Underground Train, Tate, Tate Modern Art, 
architecture building city. So they've automatically created these clusters, which as you can see, have a lot more coherence. And so these are kind of a higher level organization that's just emerged from the tagging itself. Hasn't been imposed in a top-down fashion. They've just looked for where there are sets of three terms, uh, three or more terms that are very heavily um, uh, cross-correlated, used together, and use those to extract out a sort of more focused set of photos from that last group without requiring people to sort of consciously try to create these clusters. And just one other example of a new, of a new feature within Flickr um, is the notion of pools, where they, they, have, they have a particular topic uh, that, that they may have generated that people can then post their photos to. So it's kind of a, a, uh, a, a slightly more designed um, tag, and this one's called In My Neighborhood. And so then people... Uh, a range of different people will just go out and put in a photo that's from their neighborhood so that they that they like okay now i want to move to the to the next this next challenge which is that when you find documents they're often difficult to assess um, when you find them online and that the the context that explains the documents is uh, often buried in some in some email or other um, or other place and here, I want to discuss weblogs as a potential source within enterprises for dealing with this problem of understanding the context for a, for, for a document. Uh, and here I've just put up a couple examples of weblogs. We tend to think of weblogs as being, uh, because the vast majority of them have been, um, sort of online, kind of online diaries of uh, mostly um, created by people from the age of like 17 to 23. The 23, the vast majority are, um, and the one on the right is in that category. It's a graduate student uh, weblog. The one on the left is actually a uh, an, a corporate weblog. It was it's a weblog that was um, a blog that was created by two. Microsoft anthropologists who go off and spend time in uh, countries in Latin America and Asia and Europe and and sometimes in, in strange parts of the United States, you know, Texas and unfamiliar to those of us in Redmond. Uh, so they, they spend time out there and they and 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 uh, are looking at, in very in, in close detail at um, different aspects of how people are using technology or even people who are not yet using technology. Um, and then typically they would come back with their photos and, and, and tapes and, and write up reports. But now what they've uh, started doing is they post a daily, uh, a daily entry to this, to this web blog. And so you've got, you've got sort of the, the set of entries in the, in the, uh, in the center. If you, there's a photo story of the day in the upper left corner. If you click on that, then you get a, an audio narration of what they did the day before, who they visited, what they saw, and a set of still photos that accompanies that, that narration. You know, at some point you could possibly imagine a uh, video there, um, although the editing would probably be, daily editing might be a challenge. And, but then, and, then if you, and then you can go through and you can look at their past entries. So it's, it's got that sort of chronological weblog uh, format. And that was very successful when they did that. You know, the first time they did it for a for a, uh, uh, the, not only did their team members go in there and find this a very engaging way to see what they were learning, but also other people within Microsoft here in Redmond who came from the country they were visiting, which was not New Zealand. I sort of disguised the the, the country in this in this slightly fictionalized, um, very mildly fictionalized example. But uh, but the people from that country were also very interested in reading these accounts, and of course they could then contribute other information that that helped understand that culture, that setting. Okay, now I want to say a little bit here about um, so how many people here keep a web, web blog? How many people actually have a web blog, personal web blog? So not very many. How many people here have read a web blog? So okay, so that's most of us. Um, how many of you would say you read one regularly? So okay, now we're down to only four or five. So, so, um, just to uh, to sort of put uh, the, the the web logs into at least one perspective here, and also indicate how fast 
these emerging technologies emerge these days. This is from Gartner Group, and they have this kind of hype cycle of, you know, of technology tri trigger and sort of the, the, the rise to the inflated expectations and the trough of disillusionment and finally reaching a plateau of productivity there. There's something that's slightly... Uh, slightly misleading about this because there's kind of this assumption that everything ends up getting out there to that plateau of productivity. You know, some of the things may, may sort of shoot straight down at that point. But um, nevertheless, uh, this, is their, this is their curve. And this, here we have it sort of filled out with every technology that you can imagine practically, uh, and many that you probably haven't. And so I've just sort of brought out a few that are of relevance here. Corporate blogging, that's where they put, that's where Gartner now puts corporate blogging. So it's already passed. The, so if you haven't been, uh, if you haven't already been deeply affected by the hype, you've kind of missed the, the peak of the wave there. Um, they now see it coming down the, the, uh, toward the, the trough of disillusionment. But I think it's going to make it out there to the plateau of productivity. I've also left in RSS, um, which, I'll, which I mentioned before, we'll say a little bit more about. And then there's wikis also. They're all kind of clustered there. Uh, Wiki's a little further down for some reason. Um, okay, so what are web blogs? Um, okay, they're the frequently updated uh, uh, website entries. Um, they appear in reverse chronological order, so the most recent, which is the most interesting one, is, is typically at the top. Now, although the technology does not enforce it, um, Web blogs, the majority of them are a single voice. I mean, because the majority of them are authored by one person. And even if there are multiple authors, very often there are people who came together because they have the same message they want to get across, like they're all the people who, you know, they're a group of people who work on the Howard Dean campaign. They may, they may, all, may all author the, uh, the different web blog entries, but they're probably not going to have arguments there on their, on, their, on their web blog. So it's kind of this single voice notion. You kind of know what you're going to get when you go there. Um, but then what's often uh, not focused on is that there's a great deal of, there are many features in the, uh, in the web blog architecture that foster social interaction of different sorts. Okay, and, and one of them is just the fact that it's so easy, it's so fast uh, and easy to, to be notified of a posting and to distribute information that way, that, that way, that fosters interaction. There are also, many of them allow comments, so you can comment on the, the, the blog posting on the site. The comments will be, written, will be visible to other people um, in a, you know, by clicking on the comments link. Um, they often interlink uh, across blogs. And there are some other features that I'll work through now that, that uh, foster this social activity. But apart from that, you know, who authors them, who the audience is, what the topics are, what even media are involved, all this varies. So this is courtesy of Gina Vinolia, um, a colleague who put together this little, this little animation. Um, so here you've got the basic, the basic uh, technology. You've got a person who sets up a blog. There's a, uh, and there's a blog server that, that's often, that can be freely hosted blog server out there, like Blogger was one of the early ones. It's been bought by Google. It's still out there. Microsoft has MySpaces. So there, so there are these, these free, freely hosted servers out there. And you have, a different, you have different possible interfaces to your blog. You can just have a web user interface or a client application that comes along um, with the, the server. So the person there posts... An, an item to their, an entry to their blog. Then what happens typically, I mean, depend, there, there are some different approaches by different blog servers, but, but, but the, the, the standard is that when somebody has posted uh, an entry to a blog, the blog server sends a notification to the site weblogs.com that this post has been, has been made, and it actually sends the content uh, sort of packaged in RSS, so it, it sends this... Uh, this is sort of as metadata sends a content to weblogs.com. So at weblogs.com, there's just thousands of these postings, millions of these postings are streaming through. All that weblogs.com is doing is posting out. There's a new post to this. You know, you may just post once a week. When you do that, it goes out there. And so weblogs.com has all of this activity, uh, has this record of the activity that's going on in blogs around the world. And any any third-party software can sit on top of 
you know, can, can, can view weblogs.com and see what is being posted. And so you've got a lot of services that can sit up there and watch the traffic on the blogs around the world. And so, for example, um, and, these will, and, and, and make services available to other people on the web. So one of the things that they can do is you can actually track a particular term. So if you're interested in every time your name is mentioned in a blog anywhere in the world, you can go and be set up and, and get set up to be notified that your name or your product, if you're working on a product or, or the organization that you're working for, um, anytime they're mentioned, uh, you can be notified uh, of the fact that somebody in some blog somewhere has, has notified you. And the blog server creates a unique URL associated with that post uh, called a permalink and, and sends that along with webblogs.com. So you actually have not only the, fact, the text and the fact that, the, that, that something has been mentioned, you also have the link right there that enables you to go back to that post on that person's blog or web blog to read it. Okay, so now let's take another person who's just interested in reading your blog post. So one way they can do that is they can just use their browser to go out to the blog server to the to the location and read the item you post. So you can then go out once a week or once a day and sort of see what you've done uh, in your blog if you've if you've added anything to your blog. Now that's a little bit time consuming. It has to fire up the browser and it's kind of a, a pull technology. You've got to go out and, and check. But there are another thing that you can, uh, you can do is you can get an aggregator. There are free aggregators again. There are some that you can pay a small amount for. And what the aggregator does is it goes out and checks for you. So if you indicate I'm interested in, in this set and in, in this handful of blogs or this particular blog, the aggregator will go out and check periodically. And if it has, it will bring it back and notify you. In fact, some of them can, are integrated into your email, so you can actually get notified directly by email or in a folder in your email, uh, uh, in your, in your email system. Um, you can just accumulate those blocks, and you no longer have to go out and check to see if somebody has posted. And you no longer have to fire up your browser each time. So this enables you to actually scan far more blogs in a short period of time because you just find all the entries in your, um, in your system. Okay, so now this person has read, uh, has read my blog post, say. Now let's say this person um, also has a blog. And let's say they find, so they've got their blog server. And let's say that they think that my post is interesting and so they mention it in their blog. And they put in the permalink, you know, the link. They can, just, they can just click on the link. They can just very easily just cop, drag, you know, copy and paste the, the link into their entry. So it's, it's very easy to set up, that, uh, to, to set up that, that citation. So they now mention my post, my recent post, in their blog. Now, their blog server looks at their post and it sees this permalink that came from my from my site, and so it recognizes the fact that they are referring to another blog entry, and so their blog server then communicates to my blog server, somebody has just cited that particular link. And my blog server, if I've set it up to record trackbacks, what's called trackbacks, my blog server can then put up on my site, it can have a list of everybody who has referred to this particular post out there in the world. And so if I want to list the trackbacks, I, can now, I will now have this set of, uh, I'll have that information. When I then go to look at my blog, I'll see, oh, here, you know, here is somebody who has cited, you know, who commented on my particular blog entry. I wonder what they said. I can go and look at it. Of course, they could also comment on it by commenting directly on my blog post, in which case anybody who goes to my blog um, site will see it there by that mechanism. So here are the sort of the, and to summarize, here are the aspects that make, that, that, that really um, help blogs work as social software. It's extremely easy to publish. Uh, the, the fact that you have published something is very easily discoverable by other people. The fact that you've got 
they, like permalinks as a sort of an automatic mechanism, reveals social patterns, reveals uh, interaction patterns. Sort of the, the permalinks, these unique URLs for each post are a key part of this of the whole system. And then syndication is another important factor which allows uh, one to read them very easily without having to remember to go out and look periodically. Okay, so now I want to turn to how blogs um, are, can be used in workplaces and enterprises. Okay, so most blogs, I said, are, are these sort of interactive diaries. You also have the A-list bloggers, the people who are very well known who blog on political or technology or other events. So what is the progression of uses within corporations? Well, for just as a sitting in a corporation and reading blogs, one is you can get very rapid access to event coverage. If I did not attend a particular conference, like there was one conference, um, but I missed, there were people, there were students out there blogging it. I could get surprisingly detailed accounts of what was going on at that conference just by searching for their blogs and finding these blogs. And so you, that's one, one benefit. Another is for many people, you can get by uh, setting up these, these uh, monitoring capabilities that will report back to you when your product or your company or you, you yourself are mentioned. Uh, by setting up that, that feature, you can get a lot of insight as to how people are talking about or, or any particular topic that's of interest to you. That's another uh, strong use just for monitoring the blog activity. What about outgoing from blogging from within the, within the organization? Um, here, the, the third one, this, this setting up externally facing blogs, having employees blog uh, in blogs that are readable by the, the world is a, is a major focus right now in corporate blogging. That's essentially what they're talking, what Gartner Group is talking about. Um, and it, it's risky because you have employees talking about what's going on in the organization. They could be revealing secrets. They could be saying they could be saying prejudicial things of different sorts. So there's a certain risk involved. But there are also some real benefits in connecting to customers and connecting to people outside and putting a human face on your enterprise. And so, in a lot of high, you know, the high tech companies, including Microsoft, are wrestling with this issue. But on the whole, the the positive. Um, Positive effects of, of placing of, of of having people outside be able to connect to people inside, see that there are real human beings in there, um, has the, the benefits are, are seen as outweighing the risks in the most cases. And this is of, of interest because what you tend to read about in the media are the rare cases of where uh, somebody has uh, done something that's caused a problem. Um, but on the whole, there's this there's this. Uh, um, on the whole, at this point, I think in the organizations we've looked at, the, the benefits are seen as outweighing the risks in the area. In fact, my intern, Lilia Efimova, is, is, uh, has been looking at this this summer. What are the attitudes? What are the behaviors um, around corporate blogging within Microsoft? And most of it is this form of externally um, visible employee blogs, and there are thousands of them. Uh, now, the, to, to, to actually finally get to the knowledge management uh, uh, aspect of this, I think that what we're starting to see here and, and elsewhere, and I've, I've seen other cases in other, in other companies, is that you're going to see the sort of internal equivalent of number three, which is this putting an external face of your organization to outside organizations within an enterprise of a certain size. Um, a project can communicate with, with other people within the organization uh, in, and, and get some of the same benefits. It can be a, uh, a way for people in one project to communicate with other people in the organization who might have some interest in what's going on in that project. So I want to contrast how this might work, how features taken from blogs might work, contrast that to the document repositories that we often see. So you, and I'll give, uh, I mean, one example is SharePoint. Um, this isn't a, a SharePoint site, but SharePoint is just a, a set of documents. And they can be useful. They are used, they are very heavily used in some situations. But they're, it's not ambiguous. When, when you, when you tell somebody, that somebody's interested in your project and he has a need to know what's been going on in your project, you say, we've got a document repository, go and look at it. Um, often when they go to look at it, 
it's quite ambiguous what the objects in there are in there for, even when they were put in. Uh, as I said before, they, they could be there for different reasons. This could be the final form of the document. This could be an obsolete version of the document. Uh, this could be a document that's put out there for comments. You know, some parts of it might be complete, some parts not. Well, the problem is what you don't have in these document repositories is a readme file that explains the status of what each of the documents is about. And you're not likely to get them as a rule because it's a moving target. The, the status of the, of the documents is changing all the time. The readme file has to be updated all the time. Another sort of analogy is in commenting code. You know, for a project, all these documents are like code uh, in, a, in a software program. They're, it's missing the context. It's missing the comments that people used to have to be uh, sort of coerced, programmers used to have to be coerced to add to the code to allow people to come back later and make sense of what they had done. Um, now, often when you do, when someone posts an object onto the document repository, they send an email out to the distribution list of all the project or team members explaining why it's out there. And the problem is that for somebody from another team, they weren't on the distribution list, they can't get access to that. Even somebody in the team, or even the person who posted it themselves six months later or a year later, um, may not know that there was an email out there, they may not be able to find it. If they did happen to keep it, they may have to go through a whole list of a whole email distribution list, opening one message after another to try and find it. So it can be very problematic to try and track down the information in that form. And this is where the concept of project, a project log comes in. So it's basically a document repository connected to a blog where instead of posting the explanation for the object out to an email distribution list, you just put it into something, you know, into a blog or something like a blog. And the blog will have a link to the repository, so you'll have a direct link between the object and the explanation for why it's there. So in this and this notion, the blog entries can, are sort of brief description of documents. They can also be reminders of things that need to be done, sort of the current status of a project. But basically, they're not a place where you have long debates and discussions about, the, about certain decisions that have to be made in the project, because if you put all of that into the blog, it would be very hard later for somebody reading through the blog to find the particular status information, the particular explanation they want. So if you did have a long discussion that was that um, you would probably want to carry that out in an email distribution list, and if it was something you might want to refer to later after the decision had been made, you could then sort of package it up as a document, put it out there in the document repository, and put a link in the blog saying, here we had an interesting discussion, this is what we've decided to, you know, to, to do for now, and, and link to the actual discussion for people to see later. Now, I set up a couple of things I've been working on. I've used a few of these. I've found others. We've found others that are used internally in Microsoft. I've found others that are used in other organizations. One of the nice features about them is it's actually easier to, to, to send an explanation for a document to the blog as a blog post than it is to email it because with the link set up on my, on my, uh, on my homepage, I just can click on it. I don't have to type in even the address of the uh, email distribution list. So it's, it's not more work it's for me, and it has these benefits of being a place to go for other people inside or outside the project. So this is one of the ones I, I do. is a tutorial that Steve Poltrock and I give um, a couple times a year uh, at different conferences. We'll be giving it next week at Interact 2005, um, where we have different versions of it, and we and we, once every six months or so, we go, th go through to revise it. And it's just been a sort of a, a management nightmare when we set up a blog here on Blogger and, uh, and a link to a, just so, so this is, uh, this was, um, before it was bought by our competitor Google, before we had uh, 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 a, uh, a competition for it, but we're still using this one. Um, and then we have a link to another freely hosted external site, the BSCW site uh, that Fraunhofer GMD set up in Germany, where we've got all of the documents associated with the tutorial. So we've just got that, that link there. So a couple more points about the, um, about the why the blog is useful. One of the limitations, in some respects, is that you've got all the posts in chronological order. Uh, but in some 
and so that's, that is a, a constraint, but it's also useful in some ways. We're very skilled at reasoning about chronologically organized information. Our lives sort of go chronologically. Films mostly go chronologically. Books, novels. So we're very good at reasoning. If, if something mentioned, was mentioned for one week, the next week, and then it's been a month since it's been mentioned, we can make some assumptions about it. If it's been mentioned you know, more recently or continuously, we'll make other assumptions. Also, it's much easier, it's very easy to skim through chronological information. But it isn't structured. I mean, you haven't taken all that information and kind of organized it periodically. Um, that's effort. So there is an effort involved there, and it's an effort that people aren't always willing to do. People aren't willing to create the README file for a document repository. But structured information is important. It's especially managers in particular spend most of their time dealing with structured information. Now, it's not inconsistent with this approach because you can create structured information and place it in the document repository. Um, nevertheless, I think that what you're... Uh, I, I don't think that the example I've given is what we're going to see. I think you're going to start to see some of the features of blogs merged with some of the features of document repositories in the near future. So I think you want to stay tuned to what's happening in products like SharePoint and, and, and others and expect to see these coming together because I think that they do afford some real, um, uh, there's a real potential there for making document repositories more useful. For other purposes though, wikis, which are these structured uh, shared web pages are more useful or appropriate, but they do require more top-down management as a whole. So I've just put up here, this is a slide for Wikipedia, which is the most widely known um, wiki, not necessarily representative, but it's an encyclopedia, uh, very popular, that is, um, you know, it's, as it says here, when, again, I downloaded this a while ago, 560,000 articles on it. It's maintained by, I think it's hundreds of thousands of people have contributed to it. Uh, it has, it has, you know, you can, all the articles, you can look back through all of the previous versions. Anybody can go in and edit it freely, but there is more, uh, there is more work involved in maintaining it. So historically what people have done often is they actually go to people to find, to, to find the access to the information or the objects that they want. Uh, and that's been another focus of technology, which is to try and help us, is to try and put together expert expertise locators or expert locators in organizations. I've worked on, those are included in the projects I've worked on, and those also have not worked out when, when we've done them. Um, the, and there are some, there's some nice research on the, the difficulties of creating a, a te technology uh, for expertise location. One is that the, uh, that the very complex incentives that people have and, and sort of social processes for finding information. You don't always want to go to the leading expert and, uh, on a particular issue. You might want to go to somebody who's not quite as busy or, or somebody you know who knows a little bit more than you do first. Um, nevertheless, uh, people are working in this area and I think search technologies are, is, I'm not going to, are more familiar to us, I'm not going to talk about them, but they are just advancing very dramatically. I think search is another key piece of this puzzle, which is going to uh, allow um, us to home in much more easily on both the people that we might be interested in approaching within an organization, and the, um, as well as the information itself. And I think that we've kind of seen this interesting history and the development of search technologies, which is sort of the first huge success was, the, was of course, uh, the search engines that run across the, the web. So you've got that, the, the entire web that you can access. Then more recently, you have these individual search engines allow you to search for information on your own hard drive. And what's kind of been missing there are, are effective tools or widely used tools for searching across the enterprise or or organization, and um, that's kind of the third, uh, the third domain. It's the most relevant domain for the knowledge management problem. The reason, I mean, a key reason why that's difficult is and more difficult than the web is, of course, because we've got very, very heterogeneous within organizations. There's very heterogeneous platforms um, that uh, that need to be dealt with. But people are working on that, and so that is. Um, 
undoubtedly going to uh, advance quite dramatically. There's huge competition there. And one exercise there for your search is if you type in the three words shirky, ontology, overrated, there's a very elegant essay by Clay Shirky, a sort of a well-known blogger on, called Is Ontology Overrated? where he is addressing this issue uh, that came up in tagging as to what are the, the relative benefits of a top-down hierarchy and ontology such as we see in the sciences, such as we see in, in libraries. Um, and from the, the title, you might guess that he's making what I think is a very elegant argument that uh, bottom-up organization has a lot of potential, that we tend to place too much trust in, in ontologies. So I want to conclude. Um, I think that that these very lightweight tools that are all that have both individual benefits but are also social in nature, um, and that make information highly visible. That I think that's one of the key elements in, in all these is that information is very visible, it's very accessible, it's very easy to see what other people are doing, to compare what you're doing uh, with what other people are doing, that these greatly expand the possibilities for knowledge management support. Um, And the and of course the okay the they're emerging very very rapidly and I think as students who are using these more heavily than 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 I am than than many of the people in enterprises as, as they enter the workforce I think it's going to flourish and it's going to happen much faster than it did with earlier technologies like email and when we went in to the organization and they weren't so enthused about email it was very expensive to actually get email servers in there so. So I couldn't do it. I was, uh, you know, it took years before, the, before grudgingly they finally started to bring in email servers and we could show them what you could do with email. But these new technologies are often these freely hosted uh, aggregators, freely hosted blog servers, uh, the tagging support is freely hosted out there, IM clients you can download. There's no, there's, there's very, there is some infrastructure issues there. Uh, but it's extremely easy for people to just pick them up and use them in organizations. And so as students come in, there will be nothing to prevent them from making use of the technologies from, from the outset. So I think it's just, uh, I think Gartner is right that these things are going to move, are moving very quickly um, along uh, a curve. Another point um, that emerges from looking at these is that although the technology is a key, is, is sort of a key Part of it here, the social practices and the social conventions that spring up around the technology use are really critical. And so the, the technology does not uh, enforce the way that it's, the, that it's used and, and, and can't. There is this sort of very bottom-up aspect to it that, you, of course, you could use a blog site to have, uh, you could put all of your email out there, have, have many long discussions, and turn it into something that's not too much more useful than than a, an archive distribution list. Um, so there will be sort of a, a working out of what are the conventions, what are the practices. Again, this is an area that students and others will, who have had more familiarity with the technologies will bring with them. But that you need to think if you're bringing them in, it's not a matter of just putting the technology there and expecting it to happen, that there really has to be a focus on what are the, the behavioral practices um, that, and what are the incentives that people have that go along with the technology. And then I think there are still unresolved questions about how much of this can happen in that kind of a bottom-up fashion and what will be the, the trade-offs between, um, between sort of top-down structuring and management and this bottom-up uh, self-organization. Okay, so I'll conclude there and thank you and would welcome any comments or, or disagreements or, or uh, supporting statements. <laughs> Judy. I'm really intrigued with your idea about blending blogs and uh, structured knowledge management. But in my own experience with having these shared repositories, is we, when we start a project, we just dump stuff in there. And yes, we can link it to a blog. But later, we sort of get the idea about what the organization is. And so we will structure it in the, in the knowledge base. Right? So we have to then quote, rewrite history about how you find that again in the blog. Is that a killer problem, or is that just doable? Well, I think, uh, well, I think that's... Um 
so the so I think there's a, I mean one thought that that just uh, uh, triggers is that along with these technologies like if you go out and look at Flickr there are also some very interesting things that people built on top of Flickr for visualizing it so there are tools that are sort of springing up around these and I think so they're different they're so they're, there may be different uh, so I, I, I guess I wouldn't limit my response by I would, I would hate to be too pessimistic just because my imagination is a lot more limited than many of the people who are out there um, but, I, but I could see that there could be tools that would allow you to have both worlds. You could have the old view and you could have it restructured in some way and people could see, see it from the new view and maybe eventually the old view would fade out. Um, uh, I, I think that, uh, I mean, I think one of the interesting aspects that that, 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 that uh, gives rise to is, if, is that one of the things that the tools of the future will presumably be designed to do will be to facilitate change over time because that's what we've seen what Lilia has been has been finding in her study of, of, of weblog behaviors in the corporation is that change over time is, is is a very critical thing that comes up over and over in different in, in different phases and I think that if the technologies don't find some way to support that kind of activity that could involve I mean it could involve just you reorganize it you have a different structure and you start over again um, but it could also be something that's much more evolutionary and organic and I would think that the latter is is pointed to but I think that's a that's clearly a research area and I think that whole area um, is going to be one that's going to be a, a very big focus because our experience with these things is so new that we're just starting to encounter, you know, on a on a on a wide scale, you know, a wide enough scale to catch people's attention uh, as a you know as a as an interesting problem to work on. We're just starting to to um, encounter that. And I mean, I, I'll, I'll give an example from the. I mean, a sort of a different example, but from the web blog, from the web blog domain, somebody, an employee starts who's, who just wants to, to talk about the product and, and, is, and is a natural kind of writer, starts a web blog about a product, uh, about a product. And one of the changes over time is in the beginning they think, well, I'm not going to put any personal stuff in there. I'll just put, just put in a, and I'll just talk about the product and give information and, you know, and third parties or, or customers who are interested will send comments. And a lot of that happens. And then they happen to mention, you know, what they did over the weekend or something. And suddenly they get a whole lot more response from people. So one thing you see is that people start to, they start to put a little bit more personal stuff into these web lives just because it is engaging. Um, but then, after a couple, you know, after a year or so, the person is now identified by the outside world with the product, and now they take a different job. And so suddenly, you've got this kind of a uh, of, of an issue where everybody's is, they're still getting these questions, and they'd still like to help, and they still try to help, but but they are but they're getting less they're, they, their knowledge is getting less and less current and and yet and so then what do you do do you turn it over to another person do you I mean so that's that's one example of how the, the sort of the it's a different example of how change over time enters into this and I think that how um, you know whether there's going to be how technology could first of all uh, sort of a, a social or approach to dealing with these things has to be worked out and then almost certainly technology could better support it than it does now once you actually figure out what people want to do and what will actually work for for people so I think that in your example and you know and and uh, and others it's that's a it's a great research area I think it's going to be an important one Richard with respect to weblogs are there is there any sense of what the ratio of readers to writers needs to make them kind of sustainable or useful. Well, I think uh, I think that's um, that's pretty. I mean, that's I don't know what context. There are a lot of people who are perfectly happy writing uh, with no readers at all. I mean, diaries. You know, diaries. People have have uh, <laughs> have kept diaries for um, for centuries without having any readers except themselves and possibly some posthumous reader they, they might have imagined but uh, or a few friends and so I think there's a huge degree of variability there are, a lot, there are many blogs that are set up specifically for a group but sometimes you can limit it access to a group and so so for those purposes it's, it's quite limited um, I think it, it gets 
It's a sort of the same issue that comes up with distributionless or news groups. I mean, news groups are another example of where that kind of issue gets wrestled with, and and you get sort of write-only news groups, but then you get and you get some that are very discretion-oriented. And I, so I think it, it's going to vary, and there certainly will be some cases where without a an adequate readership, then it ceases to be of any use. And I think that's one reason why the internal, within, within Microsoft, where, where we've been talking to people about externally facing blogs and internally facing blogs, there are a lot of people who just don't think internally facing blogs are worthwhile, partly for the reason that you describe. Other people do, other people use them and, and do find them very useful. So I think they're it also depends on the motivations of the people who are blogging. I mean, some people really want the large readership, and some people don't. Uh, so I don't know if there's a, a clear answer there. I mean, you see, you see some progressions. You see some people will start off with an internal blog in an organization to sort of get a feel for it, and then decide, well, there's, you know, there's no reason why I can't make this available to, a larger, to the larger public. It seems to be useful. Nobody has... has Complained about it, and uh, and and then they find that very, they sort of find that very reinforcing. You also find people who inside an organization start to blog externally, and then other people within the organization discover it through the external blog. So you actually get internal communication through an externally facing blog as well. Uh, once it goes external, then it gets picked up by the ag by the, you know, by it can be picked up by aggregators. It can also be picked up by the the um, by the monitoring services, and so, so I think that's. I say news group. I, I, I say the technology has uh, a lot of advantages over news groups, and news groups have that you know raise that same issue. Um, yeah. So you kind of brought up you know, about blogs. Some people are happy to blog without anyone responding. Do you see any differences between what we call public? Uh, communication software forms such as blogs and, and uh, forums and those sorts of things, and then private versions like IMing and emailing, which you can make email broad, broader as well. But do you see differences growing out of that, or do you see it being basically the same direction on private versus public? Um, well, I think uh, I mean, IM is uh, IM is pretty is usually quite a bit more targeted. You don't see, yeah. So I think that uh, I mean, I think that they that in some way, I am and, and and blogs are are kind of complementary for a lot of people. I've you know I've talked to people who have who were heavy email users and started a blog and shifted to I am and, and saw their email use almost drop off because because I am kind of handled the real time communication needs and the blog handled the slightly more asynchronous. Uh, even if it's just to their family members, to their sort of extended family, they could put it out on the blog and if they Whereas IM, they sort of needed, for anything that they needed, a, a kind of a quicker response. So I guess I see them as, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how the features, um, how diff features from different ones might be merged together and, and how they might uh, work together. Because you had your five pillars for communication software in there. You know, like with IMing now, it's real common in our, our company to turn on IM logging. So you can always go back and refer to those previous conversations. Right, but you yeah, but probably you wouldn't. But I would change the behavior in your company quite a bit if you made those IM logs visible to the whole company. <laughs> so that's, uh, in fact, we've you know in another you know another case we looked at a company where they did um, start to just archive them, and it was only for security or you know if, uh, reasons. But still, that shifted the behavior in the company. Just thinking that somebody might be reading the, the IMs. And so, so I think there is still that distinction, which is IM is still seen as being more informal, even though you can log it. Uh, and, and, the, and blog postings tend to be, people tend to spend a little bit more time thinking about them and polishing them than they do IM for most purposes, at least externally facing blogs. So I've heard a number of anecdotes of blogs and what these in particular are being used as single user group work, where a single user uses these for the organization of their personal management and their blog posts are readable only to them as is their wiki and their one world purpose. And your studies of this stuff, do you have any idea about the prevalence of the appropriation of groupware for a single user environment and what the implications are and more generalized adoption and use of these technologies? 
Well, we do see, yeah, well, I've seen that. I mean, I think for blogs, of course, ones that are, it's more common, and I haven't seen it so much in the case of wikis, which are just a little bit more effort. Um, but you do see that in the case of, of blogs. And you also see the, a sort of a hybrid, which is that people will, will um, do a blog for themselves, but prime, overwhelmingly for their own personal use in that sense. But they may be willing to share it with their group or even with the outside world, figuring that nobody, very few people. Uh, the tutorial blog that Steve and I do this is actually visible to anybody in the world, but I don't think anybody in the world would be interested unless it's somebody who's trying to decide who took it five years ago and wants to know how much it's changed, or maybe if we occasionally we had a third person uh, do part of the tutorial, we might then you know it might be useful to that person. But um, so I think that there is yeah, so that there can be that sort of a of a evolution from the personal use to the um, Another another kind of hybrid of that sort that we found is that Lily of that, that Lily and I found is that uh, is that somebody actually is a, they'll use a distribution list they'll they'll have kind of a newsletter a distribution list where they'll put out their thoughts day to day and then they will go through periodically like once a week they'll go through those and create a blog entry actually that goes out to a much broader you know it goes out to the public so they're kind of using the distribution list as a almost personal thing and they'll get some feedback from a few friends and then use that as a as a sort of a and collect that into chunks to, to put into blogs and so there are there are uh, um, so I so I think yeah again that's an interesting it's, that's a very interesting question, and it's both. And there's two parts to it. This, or you know, you've focused on what are people doing at a point in time, and then the other interesting thing is how does that evolve as they get more experienced with it, more comfortable with it, they start to see what kind of information they're putting in, who it might be useful for. Then you could naturally expect to see possibly a change in in their behavior. Yeah. Uh, there, there are a lot of these uh, um, sort of from the bottom up ontologies or clusters that are that are happening in, in many different forums. So you have them on Flickr, as you pointed out, with London and UK and, and so forth. And, and on eBay, when you want to sell something, there's something that eBay has created that says, you know, it's a collectible and, and so forth. It's right. really bottom up, but, but it's top down. And, uh, you know, if you go to Amazon and want to order a book, uh, it says, you know, they, readers of this book also liked, and it kind of gives you, you know, that, that clustering around that. that idea. Right. Have you seen in practice anyone or any sites looking to not not do this sort of at a at a mathematical you know real clustering uh, way, which is you know seeing where where things overlap, uh, uh, like at Flickr, but doing this from how the human interacts with the web space? So in other words, if I if I'm interacting and I type London, and then the next thing I try to go search for is oh well no no I'm going to search for UK. You know the, the the website could if it's if it's studying my human interaction instead of the the mathematical sort of clustering of data where you where you look for these overlapping matrices could could say well gee maybe you know going from London to UK to you're right uh, yeah is is actually the way to thread this and and is the right way to to, to assemble this and so we, the collective intelligence being you know if I first start searching for X and then end up searching for Y maybe Y is the the term to, to index them. Yeah, so, so a couple points. One is you can bet that, to just sort of pick a name at random, that Google is looking very carefully at those kinds of patterns over time at, at access. One of the features of blogs that I didn't mention is if somebody accesses your, your blog, a, a blog post, then a record is left of the, the site from which they came to access that post. Uh, and you stand for refer log. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Refer like so. So people. So. So you can look to see where people who have looked at your, read your blog entry came from, and very often it came from a Google search, you know, or maybe a MSN search. But basically, very often it came from a search, and you can actually because of the way that the that the the, the site is constructed, you can actually see what search terms people use to access your site. And so, as a, as a blogger in this case, you can actually look and see what were they looking for that led them to my particular site, which is, can be very intriguing. I mean, it can be very interesting. Uh, uh, 
and again, it, uh, and then that could of course influence the, I mean in this case it's the individual uh, blogger, but that can influence the way that they, they start learning about their customers out there, their readers, and they can learn you know, what, not to, what words not to use if they don't want to get distract people who clearly aren't really interested in their content but are coming from somewhere else, or, you know, or they might shape what they talk about based on that. But I think that, yeah, I think looking at patterns and use is something, if you can get access to the data, is a, is a, a it's part of that whole search, you know, the, the kind of the intense uh, interest in, in expanding the effectiveness of returning search results, which is another, which is, would be how I think that Google might be using that. Just as a comment, in general, sometimes, uh, you know, humans have a, have a problem with mischaracterizing what they think, as you pointed out, what they think the keyword should be on Flickr. Maybe, you know, this is supposed to be London or supposed to be, but actually following what they do is, is more effective because that's really how, you know, how they really index in their brain is, oh, they went to London, then they went to here, and then they went to here. That's yeah. how they really index as opposed to what they thought. Right. They yeah, you're right. Yeah, there's a great potential there, and I would hope that, and I would, exp I, I'm, I would be fairly confident that, that people are working on that. Uh, Okay, I think we have a break now. Um, right, so I'll be I'll be in and out.